All right. So perfect. Good afternoon. Uh, Patrick Lison, Patrick. Hi. <laughs> My name is Claudio. I'm calling you from Washington, D.C. And this is Christian from Santiago, Chile, uh, from the students of Fairfax City. We are very humble and grateful that Patrick Lison accepted our invitation to the show. Uh, Patrick, welcome to the show again. Thank you. Appreciate Part it. Two. So uh, first of all, how, how are you doing the pandemic? How's your wife doing? And uh, well, as I uh, told you a few months ago, yeah, Charmaine has had some health problems. She's yeah. de she's dealing with them. Yeah, um, it's a form of di di diverticulitis. So it's you know, she just has to be on a very strict diet. Perfect. Man. Yeah. But she's what, what about you? What What about you? How are you doing, man? Managing <laughs> the pandemic. I'm, you're trying to go out. I'm, I'm going to be like the one horse Shea. You know, I'm just going to keep going on just fine, and then one day I'll just drop. <laughs> All right, that's, that's good, man. Yeah, things are. I was telling Christian that here in the United States, you know, there's vaccine for everybody. Some people choose not to take it, and people like myself decided, you know, a long time ago they need, that's the way to go. And people believe on it, some people believe it, but hopefully we'll get out of this mess. And yeah, we, hopefully, you know, you can you can play with your trio, and then I can see shows, and, and yeah. people can come back to a, a normal life. Um, so, so feel free, Christian, to start with the, the, some question, and then we we kind of piggyback and go back and forth. So. Thank you, Claudia. Hello, um, Mr. Patrick Lisson. What an honor! Greetings from Santiago, Chile. Uh, greetings from a teacher. I, I you don't have to know this, but I teach English. I've been doing that since the late nineties. And huh. I, I started to become an English teacher, but then I went to work on radio. <laughs> Life okay. has strange ways. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, I understand that. Well, thank you for the time. Uh, I, was, I, I was sad that the last time you met with Claudio, I couldn't not participate, but everything comes in time. So yes. good things come to those who wait, they say, yeah. <laughs> don't they? Yeah. So, um, well, um, thank you for being with us. I've been a big fan of your music for many years. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I was going to mention Rainbow Delta that you can see at my back uh, oh, in my record yeah, display. It's just reissued. I want to show you something. Oh, 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 I was wait wow! I've been waiting for that one. Yeah, the new CD of Rainbow Delta. Oh, right. what? it's just out. It's on fantastic. Yeah, US yeah. records. And yeah, you, I, if you just uh, go on the internet and type in Patrick Gleason Rainbow Delta. Um, BSX will probably come up. Otherwise, just go to BSX Records, Patrick Gleason. Fantastic. Congrats. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to say that that was my first encounter with you, with your music. And uh, I even used, uh, I must confess, Lagrange.5 is the title. Oh, I yeah. use it. Yeah, I used it many times for my radio shows and some uh, electronic oh, sure. background music for my shows. And uh, I, I, I read once that it has some connection with some... Uh, mathematical formulas, it almost uh, is linked with some scientific background. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. I, I read a book um, called The High Frontier. This came out in the 70s, and it was by a guy who was at one time very high up in NASA. He was a PhD in physics. And what he proposed in, in his book were artificial planets and where they would be parked were at Lagrange points. So Lagrange points are where the, the degree of, of gravity pull from different adjacent uh, bodies is such that the, the artificial planet is held in a specific place in a stable manner. So you can have uh, what he proposed were sort of disc shaped uh, one mile in diameter um, foundations and a big dome above that. So there would be 10 million people living in one of these artificial planets. I thought that was tremendously hopeful. And it hasn't, it hasn't turned out to be quite as hopeful as, as we thought, because he thought by this time we would have several artificial planets going, but we don't. Yeah. Interesting. Now, I, there's another work that I admire you for. That is uh, Lenny White's Venetian Summer. I love uh, it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we were, I mean, fans were uh, lucky that Wounded Bear Records uh, rescued from, from, from oblivion. Uh, yeah. yeah. Do you recall any particular aspects of the production or your contribution to the overall oh, yeah. sound of, of that? Sure. One? Well, I don't know if Lenny credited me or not, but I was the producer. <laughs> 
And so it was my, and we recorded it at a different fur, my studio. Yeah. So it was up to me to get, put everything together. So I contacted, um, uh, well, Lenny, Lenny contacted s- s- some of the players and then I contacted uh, Tower of Power to do the, the horn tracks. Yeah. And, and uh, it, was, it was a marvelous, I mean, the people on that album, man, those, those are yeah. some heavyweight people. Viola, yeah. 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 And they were all a delight to work with. Those people were just great. Yeah. And Lenny, too. I have to tell you a funny little story about, at that time, I, I was married to uh, Patricia Barham, it was her name, and her mother was staying with us at, at, in, at the studio. My apartment was above the studio. So she was staying with us. She did not approve of me. She thought I looked like Charlie Manson, which I sort of did at that point. I had a beard and long hair. And... Um, and she just, in general, you know, wished her daughter were with somebody a little straighter. But then this one day, Lenny came up. Now, Lenny would be like this kind of person's worst nightmare. I mean, here's this, this extremely hip black man with a wearing of a big cowboy hat and giving off New Yorker vibes, right? So he and I started to work on a tune together on my, I had a Fender Rhodes up in the, in the living room in the apartment. And at a certain point, I looked over at this woman, my mother-in-law, who just never approved of me and never liked me. And she was just barely awake. And she was rocking back and forth to the music we were making. And she had this huge smile on her face. <laughs> After that, she went back to hating me. But for, for a minute, she, she, she really got it. She... <laughs> <laughs> That's a good story, man. And weren't there any further contributions, Lenny, Lenny White, after that one, after the Venetian summer? No. Well, uh, Lenny, you know, Lenny and I played in in this new trio in New York um, about a year and a half ago, just before the pandemic. pandemic. And and I want to do. I'm I'm doing two trio albums. The first one is with um, uh, Michael Shreve, and mm-hmm. the second one is with Lenny White. And and then I've used Sam uh, for, on the first album, and I'm using Lenny Pickett on the second album. Lenny Pickett is the musical director for Saturday Night Live, and I've known Lenny since he was about 15 years old. Look at that! Well, Were you neighbors or something? No, uh, he came over because of Tower and Power. He was playing with Tower and Power, and, we, and I would periodically have Tower come over to do sessions. But what Lenny and, and his wife told me later was that I, they said uh, that I was the first guy they ever saw making music and living a good life. That's an exception, huh? And yeah, and so they said that I was a, an inspiration to them. Now, if that's so, I'm very pleased because, of course, Lenny, Lenny is sort of famous. He's had an incredible career, and his wife, they're just they're wonderful people. She just got a PhD in in physics, although she's in her 60s. Well, now that you just mentioned it, I was going to, to take that topic. Uh, I was going to ask you about Michael Schriever uh, and the Bedroom Window soundtrack that I always, always uh, also like very much and I have played in my radio shows. Uh, I read about an unreleased album somewhere and you just mentioned that you have a project about something, maybe a new album with him. Well, a new album with, with Lenny and, and uh, Sam Morrison. It's a trio album. We had started it. We, we started it by recording live in Seattle. We had a professional engineer who came to the club and did a great job of recording it. But then I just felt myself that the music wasn't ready, you know, that we really hadn't taken it where it needs to go. And... Um, So I I started over at a certain point. And then I've also gotten a little bit diverted because I'm I'm just in the process of completing a quadraphonic album. Look at that. Yeah, yeah, this this is the, um, Suzanne Ciani came out with a quadraphonic album about uh, four years ago. Four years ago, yeah. And this is with the same producer. So uh, when I played Moogfest, I met the guy and he said, you know, I really want to work with you. I thought great, but he's incredible. I mean, he's, his name is Cameron V. He's he's an amazingly smart guy, very musical, but also very heavy, heavy into audio engineering. What well, do you, Patrick? Do you work with? Uh, I think uh, one of the early members of 
you know, power, tower power was uh, Hoover Tufts. You know him or who? Hoover, T U V B S. No, probably without. In the seventies, probably you don't know. He was he was from Oakland, California as well. No, and then okay. he ended up moving. He's in Europe now, but he okay. was one of the early singers of the. But what was he? What does he play? Uh, he he was a singer, the main singer of oh, Tower of Power, and in oh in this, okay yeah right right yeah he he I thought you may remember and uh, but go go ahead Christian I just wanna yeah I, I meant to ask you uh, Mr. Gleason uh, you were planning a trio or an album with Mike uh, Shreve included I didn't get yeah. it but yeah yeah Michael Michael Shreve and Sam Morrison Sam Morrison okay. was with Miles in the 80s and um, what wonderful wonderful reed player very very fluid and um, we'll come out with that album but it'll probably be I'm going to say another year because we, first we, I've got to get the album the, the quadraphonic album out which we'll, we're going to release it in August and then I hope to tour that album that's a solo album so I'll probably do that first But now we were living in the age of uh, uh, 5.1 and all those remi remixes and remastering, uh, remasterings. Uh, I wonder if that uh, quadraphonic format is easy accessible to, to people like these days. Well, um, that's an interesting point. I want to tell you about that. It's very interesting. So this guy, Cameron V, the guy I'm talking about, he was actually, I think... Sony, I think he was the first um, uh, C-suite tech guy at Sony, which meant that he, and, and uh, he, he came to Sony when he was like in his early 20s. And he left in his late 20s by that time having accumulated, a, I'll just say, a considerable amount of money. Hmm. You're in the C-suite at Sony, you're going to do well. And he, and he realized that this was not what he wanted to do. What he wanted to do was music technology, where he decided what the technology was. He's come out with this uh, particular kind of new waveform, which is what they used also on Suzanne's album, which is, um, he calls it Quark, Q-U-A-R-K. This is kind of a joke. It's an yeah. artificial element. Um, but what the, what the Quark wave file does, it senses what the output is. It's smart. And if it's playing into a stereo environment, it plays the album in full and stereo. And if it's if it senses a quadraphonic environment, it sends four outputs, four separate outputs. So it's kind of a magical, it's almost like a magic trick. And you can you can put these files up on Spotify So people can go to Spotify and pull off an album which they can listen to in stereo or listen to in quad. Uh, SACD is a, is a good format, but of course you can't play it in, in stereo. What is, SACD will only play in, in quadraphonic. This one will play either way. And then the other thing the same guy is doing, he set up a, a, a plant in the, the Netherlands which is now making, they're just starting to, I don't think they've actually come to, to assembly line process, but he's, in fact, he's there this week. And what they're going to have is a, a plant that will produce quadraphonic disc cutters for, guess how much money? Very little. A thousand dollars. Oh, wow. A thousand dollars. So, And then after you've cut the album, you can play the album on the same cutter. So it's, it's, a, it's a revolutionary new device. And I think between the, the general new interest in, in, in certain kinds of uh, enveloping environments in, in music and, and the technical achievements, I think, I think we're coming to a new age of quadraphonic. I mean, basically, when you go to a theater, you're you're hearing a 12 or a 14 channel system. So why do you want to hear a two channel system when you go home? Why why do you think uh, that it didn't work out in, back in those days, like in the 70s, mid 70s? Because Sony press they, sure. they came out with a big huge catalog. Yeah. Uh, 
I can find it easily. Let me just jump away for a second here. Yeah. <clears throat> this is the new quadraphonic version of the, the album wow. that Herbie and the guys we all made together in the early 70s. It sounds incredible. The, the, the Sony engineer that took over making the stereo files quadraphonic really took it to heart and uh, he did a wonderful job. So this is now out in quad. Not, you have to order it from England, unfortunately. It takes about six weeks. But anyway, yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, if, uh, I wanted to ask you also um, about the best memories you have uh, from a different fur. I know that you uh, established that recording studio, then you sold it. But uh, you you have some some sometimes sometimes sorry said that you were like a group of helping or helpful hippies of some sort. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Very big, relaxed. It was a commune. Yeah. It was a commune. So J John Vieira, John was a hip, you know a hippie electrical engineer. Uh, he quit his straight job and bought a Moog synthesizer, but he didn't know anything about music. So I came along and I said, let's hook up the two of us. I'll put in some money to make the, the mold bigger. And then we need to find a place where we can have a little studio. So that's how different fur came to be. You know, I'm, <laughs> what, what happened to that studio eventually is just crazy. I mean, everybody recorded it at that little studio. I mean, we had Stevie Wonder. <laughs> I mean, everybody was there. Um, and particularly from, from uh, black music. And, and also disco, we had Sylvester and all those guys. We had both the, we had the several gay um, men's labels. And then we also had both lesbian labels recorded at different for, it was, I mean, it was just a wonderful experience because we really weren't business people. We were people that loved music. We needed a studio to make our own music. And then because that was kind of expensive, we rented the studio out, but, but then it became, I don't know, kind of a, a society and, and I, I found um, my studio manager, now sadly gone, but she, but she Susan, Susan Skaggs was her name. She was just an amazing woman and she loved musicians. She was so, she was filled with empathy. So when, when a, a musician came to different fur, they didn't feel as if they were in a commercial establishment. They felt that they were among friends. And I think that's why the studio had this incredible success because people felt comfortable there. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, feel free to elaborate. I, I know the story, but probably Christian doesn't know that when you end up selling, remember that many real estate uh, developers in San Francisco ask you for, and then you end up selling to the lady and she couldn't help the money. Remember the story yeah. was like, she say, you know, if whoever want to sell the studio, please yeah. uh, let's try to work something out. And, Yeah. Feel free to elaborate on the story. It's a, it's a very good story. Yeah. But the, 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 when I finally sold the studio, I sold it to my studio manager yep. and my head engineer. I sold it to them for a little under a million dollars. And they, they had no money down. And my business attorney said, Pat, don't do this. I mean, you're the reason people come to different fur. Well, ha, ha, ha. No, I left and nobody even noticed <laughs> because Susan Skaggs was so good. And then I had another guy who came in who became the resident synthesis, uh, Pete Scaturo, who is now a senior manager at Sony. But he he came in and, and um, I lent him the money to buy a small Synclavier. He went ahead and did sessions for people. People didn't even know I was gone. And they and they paid me back. It took them 10 years. They, they paid me back. I think it was $880,000. Wow. Nothing thing. down, never missed a payment. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Interesting. Now, um, I was going to, to remind you, you, you've mentioned the respect factor in adapting classical music to electronic. Maybe this is too old for you, but uh, what was the reaction to your adaptations of Vivaldi, uh, you know, Holst? I think that the Holst album was a little bit of an issue regarding the whole estate back in those yeah, days? Yeah, Imogen, his daughter, hated it. Um, well, you know, uh, there's, there's, there's two stories I'd like to tell you, if I could, about th this. The first, of course, was the one you mentioned. Um, so at a certain point, I decided I was going to do this classical album, and I, 
went ahead and went in the studio at night and, and did the first movement of the whole planets. So I sent it to RCA. I don't even know why I sent it to RCA, but I just sent it to, to one uh, company. They wrote me back very quickly, I think in about two weeks, and they said, you know, we love the album. Unfortunately, we've already signed another artist, Iseo Tomito, to do the same piece of, of music. So then I, th okay. So then I finally, uh, there was a woman who was the head of class, Mercury Classics at, at Mercury Records. And she was a uh, kind of a, a person who liked to stir things up a little bit. And she wanted to change what was going on in music. So I thought, oh, this will be a great company to go to. So I sent it to her and, and they, they took it. But then they found out that Imogen Holst would not allow the music to be played. She felt it was a desecration of her father's symphonic poem. But the, <laughs> then the Mercury lawyer said, <coughs> excuse me, I said, wait a minute, you know, uh, you've already issued a license to, to, to meet it. And RCA said, no, we have. Yes, you have. And so they confirmed the fact that the Canadian branch of the company, without notifying Imogen Holst, had gone ahead and approved Tomita's releasing it, at which point Mercury said, okay, you can tell us we can't release it as well, but then we're going to file suit against you because you've already allowed another artist to do the same thing. So with that, we were able to do it. So that's one of the stories I wanted to tell you. The other one is briefer. I have to say, look, I'm looking back on my career, which I'm doing right now, I'm part of this release um, of this new quad album. It has a couple of CDs in it, which sort of span from my first record with Herbie up to the present and about two hours of music. So I'm listening to this music and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, really, uh, even though the, 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 my version of The Planets was nominated for uh, a Best Classical Engineering Grammy, um, even though um, it, it was favorably received, and in retrospect, I'm not that crazy about what I did. I, because I think I'm, I really missed a bet. And, and you know, look, look, listening to the, to the whole planets, honestly, it's not the greatest music in the world. It's big, it's flashy, it, it's, it's not really great concert music. What it is, if you listen to the, some of the umpa rhythms, it's just incredibly good circus music. And what I should have done, I think, is played with that idea and made it, you know, a sort of a Faustian uh, 30s German uh, decadent nightclub-like version of circus music. I didn't do that, it's too straight. Um, I, I think, yeah, I just, I, I missed a bit. Now, this, this makes me jump to another question I have at the end of my list. Uh, maybe it fits this moment. What is something that you still feel you haven't accomplished in the electronic music scene that you feel you should work on or complete someday? Maybe uh, another classical piece of music, you know? No, 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 never, no. No, never any music now except my own. Um, I kind of feel, I mean, I may feel differently in a year, but I, I kind of feel the music on this quad album is so much stronger than anything I've ever done before. But I've been working to get there for the last, <laughs> maybe close to 10 years. Um, and I mean, maybe in, maybe, maybe in another six months, actually I hope in another six months, I'll feel like, okay, there's some new further direction to go in. But I'm very pleased with this music because it, <clears throat> it really, is unashamed about reaching out and grabbing certain features of uh, American minimalism, Steve Reich, Terry Riley, chiefly. Um, and, but it also 
addresses everything I learned when I was with Herbie and, and working as a, as a composer and arranger for lots of jazz musicians. So it's, it really is contemporary jazz. And also it really is contemporary electronic dance music because I've, 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 what I've done is I've, I've inserted a lot of very interesting rhythms that cross each other. So it's got the boom, 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 but it's also got So it's got this steady beat, but it's also got all kinds of jazzy beats going on. And then the, some of the music is rather abstract. It, it's, it doesn't sound like Stockhausen, but it's on the way there. Are you a good dancer yourself? Am I a do, you, do, you, do you dance every now and then? I, I <laughs> my, my wife and I used in this in about let's see ten years ago for about a decade we went to uh, when we go to Paris we would go go to the dance clubs and the funny thing is because of my age there'd be this long line of kids waiting to get into the dance club and they'd see me, oh, here's this old white guy with this beautiful middle-aged black woman. We need them in the mix. So they just, they would just <laughs> gesture us past all the kids and we march to the head of the line. <laughs> all right. Yeah. That was fun. We but, haven't done that recently, but you know, there's a lot of the clubs in, in uh, Paris have had some problems too. Like everywhere else, yeah. Now I was I was going to ask you, uh, did you and if so, how much influence did you did you have to get from the German scene like uh, you know Klaus Schulze, Tangerine Dream, and Sh even even from the U.S. Wendy Carlos, Glass, Riley, and those people were you influenced by any of them in any way? Well, of course, Wendy is is an inspiration, but as I as I implied a few minutes ago, I really think, in retrospect, only one musician ever really nailed it for translating classics to synthesizers. And that was Wendy. I mean, she wrote wonderful liner notes complimenting me on what I'd accomplished. But the fact was that in actuality, uh, if Tamita and I were probably the two guys that came close and I don't think we got there. You know, I think, I think Wendy's work remains uh, at a pinnacle. Um, what was the other question you were going to ask me? I'm sorry. No, I don't know. Uh, if, uh, if you ever had any influences in your own creations oh, oh, by the music they generated. Well, there, yeah, I, I, I did. In fact, um, I engineered Michael Honig's Journey from the uh, Northern Wasteland. Oh, I love the one. Yeah. Good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, wonderful. And, uh, and, and then... Uh, who was the guy from Tangerine Dream? I can't think of his name. Neat guy. Uh, we were going to do an album together. And uh, and that that didn't happen because our schedules got, we, he was in, in Germany and I was in California and just got, we couldn't do it at that time. So that didn't happen. But I, I, loved, I loved Tangerine Dream's music. Yeah. Uh, I would, uh, now that you mention him, I, I, I must say this. I'm a big fan of uh, Michael Koenig's score to I Am Madman, which is a movie I really like a lot. And it never came out, the soundtrack score uh, for I Am Madman. And that's one of his unreleased works. So, yeah. But these days they are releasing so many soundtracks from the 80s and 70s that it's really amazing. Yeah. In these yeah. Vi re color vinyl records and all that is crazy. No. Yeah. The records outsold CDs last year. Yeah, yeah, they did. Now, if, if we remain in the, in the companion, I mean, in the colleagues, in the community, I'm a big fan also of uh, other people like Larry Fast, Synergy. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had the chance to hear some works by Beaver and Krauss. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Philip Glass came. Yeah. 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 Ah, they did? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, look at that. Well, Philip Glass was luckily in Chile a few years ago. And uh, I'm also a big fan of Steve Roach, Susan Chiani that you mentioned. Have you yeah. ever had any interaction, like done any music with them, projects or, with, I don't know? With uh, Suzanne or, 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 or yeah, Larry Bruce Fast. Oh, no, Larry Fast. I was briefly on, on his uh, the same label with Larry. Uh, J Rainbow Delta was on. Yeah. The label he was on. I, I never met Larry. Um, and the other was when uh, Philip Glass. Beaver and Cross, you, Kraus, you said something about them? Well, I engineered a couple of albums for Beaver and Cross. 
Um, they were they were done at different firms. 